Okay, welcome to the session on uh, scheduling and uncertainty. Uh, our first talk uh, is going to be a remote presentation, uh, choreographed by Nir, but by Leigh Lei Hay from uh, the University of Delft, uh, sorry, Delft Institute of Technology. And um, it's on taboo based large neighborhood search for time sequence dependent scheduling problems with time windows. Wow, that's a mouthful. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Vale. I'm a PhD student in Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. Uh, today I'm going to present the work called Taboo Based Large Neighborhood Search for Time and Sequence Dependent Scheduling Problems with Time Windows. This is work uh, done together with uh, my supervisor, Matthias Stewart, and Neil Yopsen. I apologize that I have to do this in such a remote way because of the delay of my exam. Okay. So I'm going to present the work according to this outline. First, I will introduce the problem. And after that, I will introduce our algorithm. Uh, and in the fact analysis section, I will introduce the performances uh, of the different new features of our algorithm. And uh, after that, I will compare the performance of our algorithm with state-of-the-art uh, algorithms on two different domains. After that, I will uh, summarize the paper and introduce the future work of this work. OK, uh, so in this paper, we study an uh, oversubscribed scheduling problem, so which means that the demand is over the capacity. So we have to select a subset of the user-specified jobs. And uh, between any two adjacent jobs, there are uh, set up times. So the set up times depends on the start time of the each job for the time dependent case or on the sequence of the job for the sequence dependent case. And each job also has time windows. So this uh, work is an important uh, problem class because it represents a class of real world problems, such as the satellite scheduling problem and the older acceptance and the scheduling problem. And this work has already been proven to be empty hard. So to solve this problem, the meta heuristic methods are used most. And the adaptive large neighborhood search is one of the most uh, effective methods. Uh, and there are also papers about taboo search, which is also a very uh, effective method. And in 2018, uh, there is a method integrating these two methods and integrating the advantages of these two methods. Uh, but uh, in the, their method, it's a two-stage hybridization of these two methods. So basically, they uh, run ALNS for a number of iterations, and after that, they use TS. So we think this hybridization does not change the short cycling nature of ALNS. So we want to answer the research question that does there exist a better hybridization of ALNS and TS with our work? OK. Uh, so our, uh, our algorithm is based on the standard ALNS algorithm. So this alg algorithm updated the solution by destroying and repairing. So in the destroying process, uh, several uh, uh, removal operators will be selected to remove some jobs from the solution. And in the repairing process, uh, insertion operator will be selected to insert some jobs back to the solution. And then we have a new solution. Uh, we propose four new algorithmic features for this problem, uh, for this algorithm. The first one is a tight hybridization of ALS and TS. And the second heuristic, we call it the randomized generic neighborhood operators. After that, uh, we propose partial sequence dominance heuristic. And in the end, we propose a faster insertion strategy considering time and the sequence dependent. We introduce the one by one. First, uh, we, call the tied, we call the hybridization of top search and uh, as a tight integration. Uh, we introduce uh, removal and insertion taboo attributes for each job. So whenever a job is inserted into the solution, the removal of this job is forbidden for the following 
uh, a number of iteration. And if it is removed, we will forbid, and, uh, forbid the insertion of this job for the following several uh, iteration. And the next, we call it randomized generic neighborhood operators. So in the ALS algorithm, there are several removal operators and several insertion operators. And we use five removal operators and five insertion operators. These uh, operators are mainly adapted from the literature. But uh, what we do is that we introduce a simple but effective randomized strategy. So for example, if we use this main uh, revenue removal, the standard ARS will select the uh, job with the minimum revenue and remove it. And in our method, we, we add this smaller random number to the original uh, revenue. So we, in, with this method, we just introduce limited randomness to the original operators and we bring some, we add some uh, diversity to the search process and achieve a better performance. And the next, we propose the uh, partial sequence dominance heuristic. So this heuristic is inspired by the genetic algorithm. And we noticed that the standard ALS only evaluates the quality of the solution according to the whole sequence. But if the solution sequence gets very long, some sequence, some solution might be rejected because of the poor quality of the long, the whole sequence. But some uh, solution might have some short partial sequence which has a very good quality. In this case, the uh, potential good value uh, in process information is neglected. So with this method, we partition the solution into multiple partial sequences, and we keep the better ones to construct a, a compound solution. And we keep more good short sequences when the solution is long. Mm. And next, we introduce the fast insertion strategy. So this strategy is used when, the, uh, when we want to use the insertion operator to insert the jobs back to the solution. And in our algorithm, we start each job as early as possible. So when we want to insert some job into the solution, we might uh, postpone some jobs to create some space for the candidate job. Uh, to determine how much a job can be uh, postponed, we calculated the time slack. So the time slack is defined as the maximum amount of time a job can be postponed before the solution becomes infeasible. Uh, so the, uh, the time slack of one job is calculated according to the latest start time. And the latest start time is calculated in a back paper, uh, propagation manner. For example, in this picture, we first calculated the latest time of the last job, and then calculated the latest time of the one that is uh, preceding it, and then one by one. Um, the time slack is calculated by uh, using the latest time minus the real start time of this job. So when we want to insert a job into the solution such as here, uh, we will calculate how much the job here must be postponed. If the time that should be postponed is higher than the time slack, then the job cannot be inserted here. And we also introduced the due time slack, which is the maximum amount of time a job can be postponed without adding penalty to any job. We propose this for the problem like the OAS problem in our paper uh, that we uh, when we complete a job too late, the job will receive some penalty to the to its revenue. Mm. And after that, we select uh, we can determine whether we can insert some job to some positions. And uh, when we have the positions, we will select the best position. So we among the positions where the candidate can be inserted without any penalty, uh, we select the one that increases the least setup time. And if no such positions exist, it means that all the positions must add some penalty to some job. Then in this case, we will select the position that adds the least penalty to the solution. Uh, so uh, in summary, in this, uh, in this algorithm, we have this new 
uh, four four new algorithm features, and we have the whole algorithm we call it ALNS GPS. Um, so in the fact analysis, we want to understand which of the new algorithmic features help and uh, when they help. Uh, according to our uh, study, the effective uh, if the effectiveness of different taboo types correlates with the completion ratio. So the completion ratio is defined as the percentage of uh, jobs that we can include within a solution. And the insertion taboo works well when the completion ratio is low, while the Removal taboo works when the combination ratio is high. And our, we find that our tight hybridization of these two methods works better than the two-stage hybridization. And the, the partial sequence dominance works better when the instance grows in size, which proves that it helps when to combine parts of the different solutions. And the fast insertion strategy works well in terms of solution quality and the time complexity. Uh, after that, I will introduce the comparison with the uh, state-of-the-art methods. We first compare it on an agile Earth observation satellite scheduling problem. So this problem is time-dependent, and uh, each job has multiple time windows. We generate the job according to a uniform distribution over two geographical regions, China and the whole world. And we compare, in this paper, we compare with a mixed integer programming model uh, in one of our previous papers. And we also compare with an early version of this algorithm. We uh, compare with the latest standard state-of-the-art ALNS for this problem. And we also compare with the iterated local search algorithm in 2018. So these are the results. In these two pictures, the blue lines are the running time, and the so lower is better. And the black lines are the solution quality, higher is better. So as you can see, both, both two kinds of distributions, our algorithm use the least time here, and also has the highest solution quality as here, shown as here. And this figure shows a clearer picture, the high performance of our algorithm. As you can see, our algorithm used the least time, but has the highest solution quality. And the next, we compare our algorithm on the OAS problem, the order acceptance and the scheduling problem. So this problem is the problem that we select has a sequence-dependent setup time. It has a very long time window for each job. And the setup time, the one special thing for this problem is that the setup time uh, the setup can only start after the release of the job. So as you can see, the constraint is shown like this. And it also has penalty for the late completion. Uh, for this problem, we compare with the iterated local search algorithm and table search algorithm and two versions of genetic algorithm and two versions of hyper uh, heuristic algorithm. Uh, here in this figure, we calculated the average gap to the upper bounds of all 250 instances that we uh, we calculated. As you can see, our algorithm has the lowest uh, average bound, and some re the result shows that our algorithm used the comparable running time. We cannot compare the, the directly compare the running time because these algorithms are run uh, different. Machines. Uh, by the way, the the experiments for the satellite scheduling problem are, were run on our own desktop. And for this OAS problem, uh, we compare. We find that also the best solution among. Uh, we find that our algorithm finds the best solution among all the methods for 24 out of 25 instance groups, and each group has 10 instances. And the average gap of all the 20, uh, 250 instances of the our algorithm is around 18% smaller than the second best algorithm. And uh, finally, we compare our algorithm with CP optimizer. So CP optimizer is widely used in the scheduling problems and show to be very effective for this class problem. And, uh, but the problem of this optimizer is that it has a global constraint, which is very highly efficient. 
the non-overlap propagator, but it does not uh, support the max term in the OAS problem. And also, it doesn't support the time-dependent setup times in the satellite scheduling problem. And it also has the local constraint program propagator, but for, for the setup times, but it is too slow to be acceptable. In order to compare these two algorithms, we have to relax the setup time of the ARNS uh, problem as this. So we simply remove the uh, max term in the setup time, and we don't restrict the setup must start after the release of one job. And according to our experiments, the average total revenue of and the runtime of ALS and the CPO are like this. And overall, the ALS CPF outperforms CPO on 23 out of 25 instances tested. So to sum up, in this paper, we studied the overlap subscribed scheduling with time and sequence dependency and time windows. We proposed a novel hybridization of ALS and TS and the three other new algorithm features. Uh, in the fact analysis section, we find that we find the correlations between the component perform performances and the problem property. Uh, in the evaluation of our algorithm on two domains, we find that our algorithm has higher, higher quality and uh, uses less time than state of the art. So our work proved that ALNS and TS hybridization is an efficient method for this class of scheduling problem. So for, for the future work, we, will, we want to further evaluate the heuristics. And we want to understand the effect of ALNS and TS hybridization and the new uh, algorithmic features on other real-world problem domains. Uh, and the most important thing is that we want to do is we want to achieve a, an algorithm which tunes itself towards different problem domains during the optimization process. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we have time maybe for uh, a few quick questions. I'd like to first. Okay. Okay. I'd like to first thank you for uh, modeling uh, for the agile Earth observation scheduling problem, uh, modeling the different windows and the different slew setup times. Um, that's I think underappreciated. But uh, did you also consider different recorder consumptions based on which opportunity you choose? Data recorder uh, consumptions based on which opportunity you choose? and different observation activity durations based on which opportunity you choose. Did you hear the question? Is it about different? Uh, so I couldn't hear very clearly. So uh, so I think the speaker is too far away from me. Sorry. Yeah, so basically uh, the question is, did you, did you handle side constraints other than the slew times, like the differing amounts of data and the different observation times for the alternate observations? Oh yeah, so we uh, so we generated those uh, instances according to real uh, positions of the jobs and uh, the real uh, parameters of satellites. So uh, the slow times uh, depends on the start time of each observation and the angle of the observations. So is that your question? Uh, no, I think that the question is about like the different data amounts for alternate observations. Other side constraints like be might be data, thermal, or different things like that. Not the specific times we understood that you handled the variable slew times in the start time. uh yeah so you mean the data amount uh, for uh, example but uh, other things thermal other things like that oh uh, no we didn't consider that in the first problem yeah so we've simplified the problem a little bit i think you might have to take that offline mike that's pretty detailed uh, do we have time maybe for one more we yeah, we have time for maybe one more quick question. Do we have another question from the audience? Okay, let's go ahead and thank the speaker again. Okay, our next talk is going to be a joint presentation from Harvey Mudd College, so I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. 
Uh, and this is on quantifying degrees of controllability in temporal constraint networks. And this was an honorable mention for the best student paper award. Hi everyone, I'm Savannah, this is Maggie, and this is Cheyenne. And today we're going to talk about how we quantify degrees of controllability for temporal networks with uncertainty. So as you might imagine, our work largely involves scheduling problems, where a planner wants a robot to perform a series of time tasks given some sort of constraint. Today we're going to be looking at a small motivational example of one such scheduling problem. Namely, we'll be considering Dr. V's experiment. To begin her experiment, Dr. V combines chemicals X and W at time T0 and waits for the reaction to end at time T1. However, she faces an issue. She doesn't know exactly how long this reaction is going to take. All she knows for certain is that it should last somewhere between 20 and 31 minutes. From here, she'll then have 10 minutes to add chemical Y to react with X and W's composite. But then again, she faces a similar problem, as she doesn't know how long this new reaction between Y and the composite will take. All she knows is that it should last somewhere between 30 and 35 minutes, ending at time T3. Then finally, she'll have 10 minutes to collect the final composite Z. Now, this graph that we've created to represent Dr. V's scheduling problem is a type of graph that's used ubiquitously in temporal planning, and it's known as an STN, or a simple temporal network. STNs consist of time points that represent the events that occur within a scheduling problem, as well as edges or constraints, which represent the time that has passed between the events. These constraints can also be represented as inequalities like the ones you see up here. Now, the whole goal of using an STN is to help planners successfully schedule all of their events without violating any of their constraints. And if they do so, they would have created a solution to their scheduling problem. Now, as it turns out, we can actually visually represent the solutions to an STN geometrically. To do so, we graph all of the constraints of the STN on perpendicular axes, as we've done here, and then look at the region that's enclosed within all of these constraints. In this case, it would be the orange triangle. This is the set of all solutions, or the solution space, for the STN. And as you might imagine, we can apply this concept to two networks of more than just two events. In general, a network with n events will have a corresponding nth dimensional polytope, a higher dimensional version of a polygon. Now, for our research, we were analyzing uh, the geometric interpretation of a slightly different type of simple temporal network. Namely, we were considering STNUs, or simple temporal networks with uncertainty. These differ from normal STNs in a few ways. The first is that in addition to the normal controllable events, STNUs have uncontrollable events. As the name suggests, these are events that the planner cannot control. So for example, in Dr. V's experiment, time points T1 and T3 were the uncontrollable events, as they corresponded to the reactions 1 and 2, which Dr. V couldn't control. Additionally, STNUs also have contingent and requirement constraints. Contingent constraints are basically just the information we have about when an uncontrollable event could possibly occur. These are represented as wavy lines on the graph. All other constraints are known as requirement constraints, and it's the planner's go goal to satisfy all requirement constraints in order to successfully schedule all of their events. We refer to the act of scheduling events as being dispatch. Now, when a planner is presented with an STNU, they're most likely concerned with how controllable that STNU is. And by controllability, I just refer to the, the planner's ability to maneuver around the uncertainty inherent in the network. There are two main types of controllability that we'll be looking at today. The first is strong controllability, which occurs when a planner is able to successfully schedule all of their events without knowing when any of the uncontrollable events are going to occur. 
A second, slightly weaker type of controllability is dynamic controllability. And this occurs when a planner is able to successfully schedule all of their events as the uncontrollable events unfold. As it turns out, Dr. V's experiment is dynamically controllable, but not strongly controllable. Now, what you may have noticed from the previous slide is that we're currently limited in how we can measure how controllable an STNU is. Either it's strongly controllable, dynamically controllable, or neither, in which case we refer to it as being uncontrollable. Our work improves upon this by letting the planner more accurately assess just how controllable their network is. Specifically, we've created two continuous metrics that do this. The first is the degree of strong controllability, or the DSC, which tells the planner how strongly controllable their network is. The second is the degree of dynamic controllability, or the DDC, which tells the planner how dynamically controllable their network is. Both of these metrics do this by approximately calculating the probability of a successful offline and online dispatch, respectively. To tell you a little bit more about the degree of strong controllability, I'll hand it over to Maggie. Thank you, Savannah. So in real life applications that required offline dispatch, uh, if the STNU is strongly controllable, we are happy because we can find an offline dispatch strategy that always guarantees successful dispatch. However, if the STNU is not strongly controllable, the traditional approach is simply giving up. But it might be more, uh, it might be worthwhile for us to pre-commit to an uh, offline dispatch strategy if it will yield successful execution most even if not all of the time. Therefore, instead of separating controllability into different categories, it will be more helpful for us to have a continuous metric that tells us how strongly controllable an STNU is. So if the metric gave us a value of one, that means the STNU is strongly controllable. And if it, if it gives us a value less than one, that means we can find an offline dispatch strategy that uh, yields the success rate in the real life dispatch. So before we talk about our metric, let's take another look at the Dr. V's example. So it turns out if Dr. V sets the two controllable events, T2, the time to add chemical Y to 30, and T4, the time to collect final composite Z to 65, her experiment has 90% chance of success. And in fact, by fixing to the specific offline dispatch uh, strategy, as long as the first reaction happens within 20 to 30 minutes, uh, all the constraints of her experiment will be satisfied. So what does this example tell us? Let's first define the realization of an STNU to be the selection of time points for all uncontrollable events chosen by the external forces. And the realization space omega of an STNU is simply the set of all possible realizations. Recall the original setup of Dr. V's example. There are two uncontrollable events, namely when do two reaction ends. And we know the reaction one takes somewhere between 20 to 31 minutes and reaction two somewhere between 30 to 35 minutes. So the blue box here represents the realization space omega of Dr. V's experiment. And as we discussed in the previous slide, as long as the first reaction happens between 20 to 30 minutes, this yields a smaller space omega prime that makes Dr. V's experiment strongly controllable with that specific offline dispatch strategy. And this leads to the formal definition of our continuous metric called the degree of strong controllability or DSC. And given any STNU, we define the DSC to be the maximum possible ratio between the volume of omega prime and the volume of omega, subject to the constraint that the given STNU with the realization space omega prime will be strongly controllable. And the key idea here is that DSC measures the offline dispatch success rate of a given STNU. And to compute DSC, it suffices if we could find an omega prime with maximum volume such that the STNU is strongly controllable. And in the previous work done by Vidal and Fakshi in 1999, it has been shown that the strong controllability of uh, an STNU can be easily verified by checking whether a set of linear constraints is satisfied. However, the problem of computing DSC is still hard because we are trying to maximize the volume of omega prime, which is a nonlinear polynomial over a set of linear constraints. And these type of problems are in general NP hard. 
So in order to compute the DSC more efficiently, we developed a linear program called DSC-LP that will uh, approximately maximize the volume of omega prime. And due to, the con uh, due to the time constraint, we will not go over the LP in this talk. More details are included in our paper. Uh, to evaluate our metric, we experimentally tested it on about 500 different STNUs, and we adapted these problem instances from the MIT scheduling data set generated by uh, Satana and his collaborators in 2016. All these STNUs here are not strongly controllable. They are either dynamically, uh, dynamically controllable or uh, uncontrollable. And in this plot, each point represents an STNU. On the x-axis, we have the LP predicted DSC uh, for each STNU, and on the y-axis, we have the empirical dis offline dispatch success rate generated by the simulation. And here we can see a clear uh, linear trend with 0.99 correlation, which suggests that our LP predicted DSC closely matches the empirical success rate, which is what we desire. Now I will hand it over to Cheyenne to talk more about dynamic controllability. Thank you, Maggie. To quickly recap what's already been said, previous research introduced this idea of strong controllability, and in our work we generalize this notion by measuring not the existence, but the probability of successful st scheduling with online scheduling strategies. When scheduling on temporal networks, we're also interested in dynamic controllability. Does there exist an online strategy that can guarantee success on the network? And in this case too, our group refined this discrete metric to a continuous measure. And to understand our approach, it might help to look at an example. So here we have a network with three events. The two wavy arrows on the bottom indicate that events T1 and T2 are uncontrollable. For example, all we know about T1 is that it will occur between zero and four minutes after T0. And the top arrow indicates that in order for a schedule to succeed on this network, T2 must occur at most six minutes after T0. Because T1 and T2 are both outside of our control, there's no way we can ensure that this last constraint gets satisfied. For example, we could just get unlucky and T2 could end up occurring eight minutes after T0. So this means this network is uncontrollable. A natural follow-up question then is, how far away from being controllable is this network? To answer that question, let's define A1 and A2 to be values realized by these contingent edges. So to be clear, A1 is a time elapsed between event T1 and T0, and we can view it as a random variable being drawn from this contingent interval 0, 4. We draw in the region of possible A1, A2 values, and among these, shade in the space of values that lead to success on this network. So this is a success, success region for this network. Previous research has played a game called network relaxation that goes something like this. You have an uncontrollable network. Can you shrink some of its contingent intervals to make it controllable? For example, for this network, if we shrunk the first contingent interval by a factor of one half, then we get a controllable network because the new space of possible A1, A2 values is completely contained in the success region. Similarly, we could shrink both contingent intervals by a small amount and smaller amount and still achieve controllability. So what this suggests is that one way of trying to measure how controllable a network is, is by seeing how much you need to shrink the volume of the contingent intervals, shrink the volume of this realization space to achieve controllability. So that's how network relaxation plays out in this small toy example. And what's pretty remarkable is that you can actually play the same sort of game and apply this approach to any uncontrollable network. So in 2006, Paul Morris at NASA showed that any uncontrollable network contains a special type of subgraph called a conflict. And for the purposes of this talk, without getting too, uh, into too much into the details, uh, we're just going to say that a conflict is essentially an evil subgraph in your network. If your network is uncontrollable, then it has a conflict, and it's that conflict's fault that your network is uncontrollable. In particular, what's really going on is that the total amount of uncertainty in the contingent intervals of a conflict is just too high. It makes it impossible for any online strategy to be able to guarantee success on the overall network. Because the lengths of these contingent intervals are relevant to measuring controllability, we're going to give them some names. We'll label their lengths using these script L variables, L1, L2, and so on. More recent work done by Nikhil Bargava, Tiago Vaquera, and Brian Williams at MIT shows that given a conflict, you can always find a number L prime, which we call the resolution constant, such that if you could shrink the total size of all the contingent intervals to be at most L prime, then you would achieve controllability for your network. All right, so that was a lot of definitions we just went through. Let's see what they mean in the context of our earlier example. 
So looking at the network from before, in this case, we had two contingent intervals whose lengths L1 and L2 are both equal to four. And what we saw is that in this case, the resolution constant L prime equals six. Because if we can shrink the intervals such that the sum of their lengths is at most six, then we achieve controllability. We're contained in the success region. So within this, uh, there's a lot of results that have been proven in this domain of network relaxation. And, and in our paper, we proved some new results showing how for certain classes of relaxation problems, you can actually efficiently shrink intervals while minimizing volume loss and achieving controllability. However, what we realize in this process is that if what you really care about is measuring scheduling success rate of offline scheduling strategies, then you shouldn't necessarily be trying to shrink intervals because that can give you severe underestimates in some cases. Instead, it might be better to try and directly estimate the volume of the success region, which is what you really want information about. So for example, for this network, the volume of that success region is proportional to the probability that the sum of A1 and A2 is at most six the resolution constant, where remember, we can view A1 as, and A2 as being drawn uniformly at random from these contingent intervals of length four. And again, it turns out generalizing this to any uncontrollable network proceeds uh, pretty naturally. Given an uncontrollable network with a conflict, you can, the volume of the success region turns out to be proportional to the probability that a sum of uniform random variables drawn from your contingent intervals is at most your resolution constant. And just to be clear here, the inequality we're showing here really is the same as the inequality from the last slide. Here we have this inequality A1 plus A2 is at most six, um, and all that changes in the general case is that a general conflict might have more than just two contingent intervals, so that the left-hand side might be a potentially more complicated sum. So what we're dealing with now is a sum of independent random variables, and that's great because it means we can actually apply the central limit theorem. And if you apply the central limit theorem, what it tells us is that we can actually estimate this probability by looking at a specific normal distribution whose parameters only depend on the lengths of your contingent intervals in your conflict. So again, we went through the setup quite quickly, but the big takeaway is that if you have an uncontrollable network with a conflict, you can g apply this normal approximation method to get an estimate of the maximum probability of success for online scheduling strategies on that network. And we were interested in seeing how well this actually works in practice, so we tested it out on the same uh, networks from the same data set and produced this plot. So the organization of this graph is the same as the previous graph. Each data point corresponds to a single network. The x-axis is our normal approximation value, that's our prediction, and the y-axis is what we're trying to predict. And because this plot is straight, um, has correlation 0.95, that suggests our approximation method does track true success rate quite well. And another cool thing about this plot is that all the networks we're testing on here are uncontrollable. So dynamic controllability um, would fail to discriminate between any of these networks, but this new degree of dynamic controllability can actually distinguish between them and label some as safer than others. All right, to summarize our work then, in our paper, we looked at simple temporal networks with uncertainty and found new ways of visualizing their solution spaces as polytopes. We then leveraged this geometric characterization to introduce new metrics that make controllability continuous. We introduced approximations for those metrics and then empirically validated those approximations. Thank you very much for coming to our talk. We appreciate getting the opportunity to share a little bit about our work and we're happy to hear any questions or comments anyone has. Uh, we have probably time for a quick question. Can you, uh, the next speaker, please come up and start setting up? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Thanks for a great talk. Um, let's stick with strong controllability for a minute. So we have methods to find uh, minimum risk strategies for strong controllability by doing things like truncation. Um, could you apply a similar technique to um, to an STNU instead of a probabilistic simple temporal network and get something like what you are getting? Or uh, do you have other thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks for your question. So that is something uh, we're looking into and some other members of our lab are looking into right now. And it seems like a lot of the approaches we have do generalize to PSTNs, but that's still ongoing work. Um, and I guess another thing is for like certain strategies like DRA or SRA that reduce PSTNs to uh, strongly controllable networks. In those cases, a lot of times you do some sort of search and see uh, what minimum bounds you need to cut off to get strongly controllable. So it seems like you could use this instead and say, okay, what sorts of bounds do you need? And then once my degree of strong controllability is high enough, even if it's not strongly controllable, I can stop then and dispatch with that. 
Okay, we can probably take one more question as long as it's a short one. <laughs> nope. Okay, we'll encourage people to go ahead and catch them at the break, uh, since we have plenty of breaks. Okay, our next speaker is Luke Hunsberger, and he's going to be talking about propagating piecewise linear weights in temporal networks. Hello. Well, first of all, thank you to the preceding group. I wish they could give my talk. Good job. Uh, this is joint work with Roberto Posenato, who I've collaborated with for many years. Uh -oh. There we go. Okay, so a quick overview. Uh, one of the things we're going to be looking at are simple temporal networks with uncertainty, uh, but also a different kind of temporal network that has uncertainty. I'll use the handheld. Test. Test? Okay. So uh, two kinds of temporal networks with uncertainty, STNUs that you've just seen, and also conditional simple temporal networks, which we'll describe. Now the key property for these that we're going to be looking at is called dynamic controllability, or in the case of CSTNs, dynamic consistency. And essentially they hold if there's a dynamic strategy that can ensure that all constraints will be satisfied no matter how the uncertainty plays out. And the two different kinds of networks have different kinds of uncertainty. Several open problems ask, how much can the network be changed while preserving the DC property? And this paper solves such problems by propagating piecewise linear edge weights. So the edge weights in the graphs, instead of being numbers, will see piecewise linear functions. So I'll give you a quick background on temporal networks talk about our approach in, uh, as applied to STNUs, and then talk about how to use the same approach with CSTNs, and then wrap up. Okay, so uh, you've seen STNUs and the concept of dynamic controllability. Uh, let's skip through some of this, except that uh, STNUs and CSTNs have different kinds of uncertainty. STNUs have actions with uncertain durations, within certain bounds, and CSTNs have test actions that generate information on the fly. Uh, CSTNUs are a generalization that uh, capture both of these kinds of uncertainty, and we showed in prior work that CSTNUs can be reduced to CSTNs, so the work on CSTNs and STNUs also applies to CSTNUs. Okay, we don't need simple temporal networks. Except to say that uh, in our work, we used uh, the single edge for a single constraint rather than a duration uh, constraint, an interval constraint. So here's an example. Uh, for example, uh, X3 and X4, uh, that duration is between 0 and 7. So there's two edges there. Uh, simple temporal networks and uncertainty, we have actions with uncertain durations. Those are represented by contingent links that you just saw. And the duration of C minus A, A is the activation time point when you start the contingent link, C is the end point, the contingent time point, and the duration is known to be within certain bounds, X, Y, but you don't get to choose how much, you only find out in real time. So in our work, we represent uh, the nodes and edges as in an STN graph, one edge for each constraint. And the contingent links have labeled edges. This is from uh, Morris Machetela's representation in 2005 and 2006. Uh, the lowercase edge, where there's the small letter C labeled on the edge, indicates that you have an uncontrollable possibility that the duration might equal three the lower bound. And the uppercase edge, uh, labeled by a capital C, represents the uncontrollable possibility that C minus A might equal 7. Dynamically controllable. Thank you for your prior presentation. Uh, as far as DC checking goes, uh, we need to propagate these labeled constraints, and you have to be careful how you do that, because not all paths correspond to constraints that must be satisfied. Only the so-called semi-reducible paths correspond to constraints that must be satisfied. So a network will be dynamically controllable if and only if there are no semi-reducible negative cycles. 
And here are the uh, edge generation rules or constraint propagation rules uh, for Morris and Michelle. F and G in their work are numbers. What we're going to do is look at F and G being piecewise linear functions. So here's an example of a problem for an STNU. And we want to know how strong, this is dynamically controllable, it's easy to check, but we want to know uh, how much can we strengthen the constraint from C1 to Y, labeled here by delta. In other words, what's the smallest value of delta, which corresponds to a stronger constraint that will preserve the DC property? And surprisingly, it's not an integer, even though all the weights are integers. So what do we do? Well, we introduce delta as a variable edge weight. So that delta will be the starting point there. And delta is, of course, trivially a piecewise linear function. But when we apply the edge generation rules, we'll get uh, you know, these crazy looking uh, piecewise linear functions. And so we need to be careful about how we uh, modify the edge generation rules to accommodate piecewise linear functions. It will turn out that each PLF is non-decreasing function of delta. There's only one variable, delta. All the piecewise linear functions will be functions of that one variable. And what happens is if we ever get a loop that has a piecewise linear function that has some region where it's negative, well, that would be a negative semi-reducible loop. So we need to restrict the value of delta to avoid where the length of that loop would be negative. And that's how we end up computing the value of delta that will uh, preserve dynamic controllability by avoiding the regions where we get semi-reducible negative loops. So after propagation, the lower bound for delta that you find uh, will be the answer. So what do we have to do to these rules to accommodate piecewise linear weights? Well, we need these uh, things. We need to be able to sum two piecewise linear functions. We need to, in the case of the LC rule, the lowercase rule, it only applies when G is less than zero. So if G is a piecewise linear function, the rule only applies to the portion of the piecewise linear function where it's negative. So that's what that second thing represents, adding G to the number X, but only the, on the portion of the domain where G is negative. Similarly, we need the max of a piecewise linear function and negative X, that's for that last rule. And then the other two things I'll discuss on the next slides. Oh, well, oh, sorry. The first three things uh, appear in the rules like that. So they're just straightforward generalizations from numbers to accommodating piecewise linear functions. Uh, why do we need uh, the minimum? Well, if this is a piecewise linear function, non-decreasing piecewise linear function that represents the weight on an edge from x to y that's already there, and you generate a new edge from x to y, which has a different piecewise linear function in green, then you take the minimum of them to get the piecewise linear function that uh, would correspond to, to uh, the updated edge weight. So you always want the strongest weight that you can generate. Now this is a crazy looking example, but uh, it illustrates the point. Then also, uh, if you generate a loop, so here we have an edge of length delta plus two on one way and delta plus three in the other, then you get a loop two delta plus five. Well, we want to avoid values of delta where that loop would be negative, so that's where we would get, uh, we would arrange for delta to be greater than or equal to negative five halves. And so it's this kind of avoiding the regions where delta would be negative that is going to give us the answer eventually. So here's our problem. Uh, and here's the propagations that result. Now, it's a crazy sequence of propagations because I, sh I showed in 2013 there are these things called magic loops, uh, which can have an exponential number of occurrences of lowercase edges in them. So here's the propagations that we get. And you can see uh, where that delta is less than eight, that's saying that we're restricting, that rule only applies uh, for a piecewise linear function where delta is less than eight. 
we keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And last but not least, from A2 to A2, we get what is a loop, semi-reducible loop. And uh, it gives us that value, 2 delta minus 3, well, the max of those two, but 2 delta minus 3 is going to be the one that, that matters. And 2 delta minus 3, in order to make that less than, uh, to make that greater than zero, we need delta greater than or equal to 3 halves. And that turns out to be the answer for the problem that we were looking at. So back here, delta being greater than or equal to 3 halves. And the reason that it's fractional is because uh, the edge of length delta appears twice in that path, in that semi-reducible path. And it's an indivisible semi-reducible path in the sense that you can't break it apart into pieces and get a semi-reducible negative loop. So the two appearances of delta in there uh, are what make the fractional answer come out. Okay, what else can we do with this approach? Well, you might want to know how much time can elapse before I have to do something. And that can be represented by putting an edge of length delta from every time point back to the starting point z, zero. You don't have to make any other changes, you just run the same propagation rules. Or what's the tightest horizon that can be imposed on the network? Similar idea, you just put a delta as an upper bound on all the time points and do the same thing. Another application involves uh, what's called epsilon dynamic controllability, where epsilon is the reaction time. So you've, you, uh, a contingent link completes, but you can't react to it instantaneously. You can only react to it after some time epsilon. Maybe your reaction time is five seconds. So you see that, and then you go, oh my gosh, I've got to do something. It takes you five seconds. And we want to know what is the slowest reaction time that will still preserve the uh, epsilon dynamic controllability. So if epsilon is equal to 10, it might still be controllable. But if epsilon is equal to 20, your reaction's too slow, then um, it won't be controllable. Well, it turns out all we have to do is modify the rule slightly. Uh, the constraint that g, instead of being g less than zero, g is less than epsilon appears in the two rules. So g, uh, ep yeah, g less than epsilon. And we're going to uh, set, what's this we have to look at? We're going to set delta equal to negative epsilon. And the only reason for doing that is so that, like with the preceding presentation, uh, the functions will be increasing, non-decreasing rather than non-increasing. So here's the lowercase rule in general. Uh, here we do it with a numerical example. It only applies if one is less than epsilon. Taking delta equal negative epsilon, that corresponds to delta being less than negative one. So it's restricting the region of values for delta to be less than minus one. So if a pre-existing constraint was five, the new constraint is three, but only where delta is less than one, negative one, and therefore the minimum of the new and pre-existing constraint would be that step function. So in this case we get, if the original weights are all integers, we're going to get integer valued step functions. What else, and I'm not going to show you results for that, but it's the same, same technique works. Uh, for a contingent link, how much can the minimum duration be relaxed? You just replace the lower bound by delta and do the same thing. How much can the max duration be increased? Similar idea, or both at once. Okay, what about conditional simple temporal networks? Well, a conditional simple temporal network has observation time points, like p question mark. And when you execute p question mark, you find the value of a Boolean proposition, p. And your constraints can be labeled by conjunctions of propositional literals. Here's an example where the observation time points are in blue. There's three of them. And is this uh, dynamically consistent? Is it DC? Well, yes, it is. Uh, and the question is here, how much can the edge from Q to P be tightened while preserving the dynamic consistency? And the answer turns out I'm going to skip that. 
and skip that and skip that. We had to do one thing. We had to change the rules uh, for the uh, dy dynamic consistency checking to avoid a problem that comes up when your value of delta that you're looking at gets closer and closer or approaches a certain value. You can end up requiring uh, an exponential number of iterations. So to avoid that, we just use that last rule which uh, puts edges of length negative infinity in, in place of uh, a negative loop. Anyway, just to see how that works, uh, the top uh, example where the length from Q to P is 1.99, after those iterations, it strengthens the edge from Q to Z from negative 13 to negative 13.01. So in order to strengthen it by one unit, you'd have to do 100 iterations. But with the new rule, uh, you do a few more iterations, but just one round of them, and then you find out at the very bottom that you get a negative loop if delta is less than two. And what that tells you uh, is that delta has to be greater than or equal to two. So in that case, uh, this question is answered by delta being greater than or equal to two. We can do the same thing regarding uh, how long before you have to do something or what tightest uh, horizon can you impose. Uh, for the epsilon dynamic consistency, uh, prior work by Cairo and, oh, sorry, Komen and Rizzi defined the slowest reaction time epsilon hat, and they created a theoretical lower bound, an estimate that, you know, your reaction time has to be greater than or equal to 1 over n2 to the k. But that turns out to be a, a very small, usually gross underestimate. Um, we'd like to compute the actual value. And we do the same sort of thing, but there's a surprising result, namely that when we modify the rule, and I'll avoid the details, but notice that the value of m that you get on the edge involves epsilon. So our delta is going to appear as a weight. And so if it appears more than once through a loop, we're going to be able to get fractional values. And that's what happens. So in this case, we ask uh, what is the uh, epsilon hat value, what's the slowest reaction time that will preserve the dynamic consistency of this? The theoretical lower bound is 1 over 48, but the actual value is, is 12 and a half. And I was looking at that before and thinking, well, oh my God, what is the strategy that requires 12 and a half? You execute W at 20, you find out the value of 20, then you execute Y at 30 and a half, because by time 32 and a half, you're going to find out the value of W. That'll tell you whether you have to execute Q and so on. Here's an, an example from Komen and Ritzy where uh, the value of epsilon hat is one quarter, and they proved that uh, painfully, and our approach confirmed that result. So you can get fractional results for sure. All right, so here's all the conclusions and future work. I'll just let you look at it. Thank you very much. Uh, we probably have time for one question, if we have one in the audience. Yeah. Uh, does it ever make sense to does it does it ever make sense to have uh, different deltas and work with them simultaneously, or are they independent? Uh, well, I think yeah, it would make sense, but I think that's going to increase the complexity of the problem because you have multi-dimensional, you know, and then how to handle that. I don't know. Uh, other questions. But you could also have a single delta to say how much could you relax how much could you relax all the contingent links by that one delta. So you know this approach would apply anytime you have one delta, but with more than one. Okay. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Can we have the we have another uh, Harvey Mudd presentation next, right? So it's okay. Going to use that, so. Pardon? Oh, yeah, go. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, the podium is not that exalted. <laughs> I'll tell you.
want to press the next one. Right, this is the Yeah, but you didn't bring the they didn't bring the USB thing, so yeah. just just use the space bar. It's okay. Uh, didn't we test this before? No, we tested this yeah. last. Oh. Uh, I don't know oh why. We did test this one too. Yeah. Just try and plug your plug back in again. No. Oh, is it working? Just tested this. Yeah. yeah, we did just test it. I wonder if it's something they did on the other side. Yeah, we did. Yeah, leave the projection low. Sorry, can you get that again? Yeah, no. Yeah. Normally, if you have it out of the projection mode, it's better. Here we go. Yeah, 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 that, yeah that, that was it. That was the problem. Then you okay. need to go to full screen. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Viva, and this is my colleague, June. And I'm here to talk to you about something that we like to call durability. It's our way of investigating individual schedules within autonomous scheduling problems. So I'm sure you're all sick of hearing about simple temporal networks already, but just a little bit of a recap. So a simple temporal network, it's a set of, basically just a set of events that you want to occur alongside a set of constraints applying to these events telling you when they should occur. And of course, we'll have you know, T0, T1 going out through Tn. And we'll all usually set T0 to be the zero time point. We'll just say T0 is equal to zero. So you can represent in STN in a number of ways. The sort of typical way of doing it is the one you'll see above. That's figure one. It's a directed graph representation, where each node is an event. And these edges represent how much time you're allowed to have between any two given events. Now, the more interesting and useful uh, representation for us is the one on the bottom. So if you'll notice, each of the constraints was really just an inequality. And each of these inequalities can be plotted onto a graph. And if you do that, you'll get something like this. You might remember this from a couple of presentations ago. So when you have this shaded area, that essentially represents the solution space of a given STN. And within the solution space, you'll notice that every single point that you choose is going to be a valid solution for the given STN. So now let's get on to what we've been discussing, the idea of durability. Just as a motivation. So in SDN literature, there's been a lot of work done relating to SDN flexibility. Now, what this usually refers to is how much can, a, uh, can uh, an SDN be altered and like, you know, how much can it uh, deal with unforeseen events and how much can it allow for changing your schedule. Now the thing is, it's not always possible to reschedule easily. And would it be possible to actually just analyze the individual schedule rather than the SDN as a whole? So what we want to find is really the flexibility of an individual schedule. We already have a framework for working at, for talking about the whole SDN, but we want to create an alternative framework that focuses on the schedule specifically. So our idea for it is, well, how much noise, how much perturbation could a given schedule take? And maybe based on that, we can somehow create something that mirrors flexibility, but for individual schedules. And what we did for this was Monte Carlo style simulations. So let's look at some of the empirical models we have for these disturbances. The first one is what we call the random walk. You could also think of this random walk as something that models the noise in terms of the actual schedule itself. So if you would take a schedule, and, within the, and remember, geometrically, it is in the solution space, and if you were to just wiggle it a little bit, if you were to just move it by a certain uh, unit of distance, and you just randomly chose which direction to go in, and you just kept repeating those steps, eventually the solution would become invalidated. So the question is, how many steps does it take? It'll probably take a different number of steps every time you try it, but if you average this every time in a Monte Carlo style system, then what you get is a certain value for how far away is this uh, solution from the boundary. And that's something that we think reflects something to do with the durability of the schedule. And a very similar model that we have is random shave. 
Now, where the first one was modeling noise into, in the individual schedule, this could no, a model noise in the system as a whole. So here, we basically take a random boundary and we shift it in by a unit distance. Now, when we do that, when we do this kind of shift, then there's a chance that the schedule will be invalidated. And if we're randomly choosing these, and again, if we just you know, randomly choose them and we keep on repeating this, uh, this process, we'll get a certain value at the end. And we think that these random walk and random shell of shave values tell us something about how durable the schedule is. And now I'm going to leave it to my colleague, June, to discuss exactly how we went about analyzing this durability. All right, so regarding calculating the durability values, we've been using the empirical models as kind of our true durability values, but the bad side is they're kind of expensive. So Viva and I had the goal of coming up with metrics that can kind of estimate the amount of disturbances that individual schedules could take. To that end, we also wanted um, the metrics to still correlate with our empirical models, and which are the aforementioned random walk and random shave. So the two metrics we came up with align with two cases. One is the pessimistic case, which optimizes for the closest boundary, and in the context of the actual problem, that's like if you have one schedule, what is the tightest constraint for that schedule in the problem. We call this the Mindus metric. The other case we thought of is the expected case, where you kind of just average across the distances from many different boundaries. So obviously it's called the expected distance metric. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have just an illustration of what the Mindus metric would look like. And then on the other side, we have an illustration of the expected distance metric. So how well do these metrics actually do? Like we said, the random shave and random walk are quite expensive, but fortunately, the metrics we came up with, which you only have to calculate once, have strong correlation with our empirical models. As you can see, the Mindus has um, strong correlation coefficients of 0.79 and 0.87, and then the expected distance has a coefficient of 0.76 and 0.79. As a side note, we have the column about the STN flexibility metric, because for um, existing flexibility metrics, they're for the problem space as a whole. So that value would actually be the same for any schedule in the STN space. That's why there would be like no correlation at all. All right, so finding maximally durable schedules. The question we had is now that we have the metrics, can we kind of use the metrics to find durable schedules? And the answer is yes. So which points have the highest durability for a given STN? The Chebyshev Center, which is the center of the largest inscribed sphere in the solution space, um, optimizes for the Mindus metric. And then the centroid, which is kind of the average of all points in the polytope, is a good candidate for optimizing for the expected distance metric. As you can see in our simple example, the Chebyshev center and the centroid actually aren't that far away from each other. But for more complicated STNs um, or less spherical STNs, they actually are completely different points. So do these candidates actually perform well? Well, what we did is we kind of, we like took the random walk values and our metric values, and we kind of compared our candidate values against just a bunch of random um, points in the STNs. And we saw that our candidates did much, much better. As you can see for all these values, they're about like four to three times better for our candidates than for any random schedule in the STN. So the high level takeaways from our research are we came up with the concept of durability, which we hope will lay the foundation for empirically evaluating individual schedules. And then we also came up with two Monte Carlo style um, simulations, the random walk and random shave. We also um, thought that optimizing for durability could help with finding more robust individual schedules. And then our geometric intuition proved that was actually the case. So this last bullet point um, about the no clear winner amongst the candidates, this is kind of some preliminary testing we did. We noticed that amongst the Chebyshev and Centroid, that one didn't clearly outbeat the other. So one area of future work we could investigate is in the STN space, is there some inner cluster of points that are sufficiently far away from the boundaries that are all good candidates? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna prefer someone who's not among the collaborators if we can first find one. But you're still gonna win, Jeremy, because no one else is raising their hand. <clears throat> so uh, just to be clear, I did not collaborate on this work. <laughs> so uh, 
This is very interesting, but, but I want to take uh, exception to the interpretation of STNs in this case for uh, your random walk metric. Because all your time points are controllable here, um, your schedule itself isn't going to be perturbed in any meaningful way, right? You get to choose when to execute these time points. But I think that your shave metric is, is a good one because this is uh, protection against uh, variability in the actual constraints themselves, right? So you could say, well, this constraint is shaved compared to what I thought it was. Uh, but do you have any concepts about how this would work if you applied it to, say, STNUs or PSTNs? It's not a short question, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for the question. And just to respond to your first comment, I see what you mean in terms of, you're right, that we are in fact choosing when to execute these schedules, so it might make a little less sense to think of it as, you know, randomly changing. But what this is meant to be is like, you know, sort of almost reflection of imprecision, because like, you know, despite what the specific time point that you choose, you know, there could be a number of real world factors that might mean that it's not exactly the right time. And we think that that's what we're modeling with random walks. As far as, you know, expanding this to STNUs and stuff goes, we definitely think that's a promising avenue of future research. We didn't get the chance to quite, you know, get that far ourselves, but we are hoping that we've laid the foundation to be able to go there later. But I mean, in fact, the, the two models that you had for perturbation, they imply a certain probability, right? So the random walk if you, is, is going to be an exponential dimensioning likelihood in the probability of any one given step, right? And so the, that maps exactly to one of your metrics, which is the exponentiality metric. And then the linear one is, uh, you might also consider in the linear one looking at, uh, there's all this work in support vector machines where they're actually trying to maximize the decision boundary distance. The, maximize the minimum decision boundary distance from the support item. So there's like a crap load of math in that specific topic that seems isomorphic to what you guys are doing. But very interesting stuff. Uh, Any one more question? Luke. Just a comment that a random walk in STNUs, I don't think that would work because you are talking about the space of strategies rather than the space of schedules. And random walk through the space of strategies well, maybe it could work, but I think there's a lot more there. But how do you define a random walk through the space of strategies? Anyway, something to think about. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next talk. Is it the same computer? Okay, which is a continuation of the Harvey Mudd session here. Uh, you're not going to tag team this one too? I'm, I'm the only one here. Oh, fantastic. So simple. Why not? And which, are you going to use this mic? That, yeah, I think I'll use the handheld. Okay, perfect. Test. Great. Uh, all right. That being set up. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jordan Abrahams, uh, and this is the work with seven other authors, um, and this is specifically on. Uh, evaluating metrics for uh, robust rescheduling while mitigating overhead uh, for probabilistic simple temporal networks. And we ended up coming up with an algorithm known as DREAM. Uh, yes, nice name, but uh, <laughs> we'll see about evaluate how that's coming out uh, compared to other previous metrics. Great. So let's go talk about a motivating example. Why does this matter? Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I like forests. I think forests are nice. Um, maybe what's not nice is forest on fire. If you're from California, you probably are aware of wildfire season. Um, so what we currently do is we're able to monitor wildfires using independently controlled UAVs. We have a UAV, goes up in the sky, looks down and sees uh, where areas are being ignited right now, which are possible high risk areas for ignition. Um, but a future reality might end up being uh, we can monitor wildfires using collaborative UAVs. And anytime you have multiple collaborative, independently, autonomously controlled agents, you need to be able to have some sort of timing and organization. And they need to be able to communicate between them. So we need to account for that. So some background fundamentals of why this is a scheduling problem. So agents have events, and events need to have some assigned time to do them. If we can't get those correct assignments, uh, we consider that the the action, the, the schedule that we conducted was a failure. If something falls too late or too early, that's bad, right? Um, some things are decided by the agent, right? We, if in the case of UAV example, we can snap a photo, that's pretty much instant, right? We can decide when that happens. 
But what about, uh, let's say, we want our drone to move uh, a mile west, right? That has depended on updrafts, right? It depends on um, like wind conditions and so forth. We don't really know how long that's going to take. We have some sort of idea, maybe a probability distribution, but we don't know exactly how long that's going to take. Um, so finally, we have the scheduler, right? That's the thing that assigns times to these actions. We want to be able to uh, assign these times, not just a just like static times, but some sort of dispatch strategy that can achieve the highest rate of success or robustness in a previous paper by Brooks et al. Okay, great. So I know you're really tired about STNs, but uh, this is a different flavor of them, and it hasn't been talked about very much previously in previous lectures, so I might as well go through them anyways. So each of these uh, nodes represents an event, uh, and we have an agent going through each of them. And we can represent, represent constraints between them using these edges. Those are just like, oh, A2 needs to occur after A1 and within 10 seconds. A3 needs to occur after A2 within 10 seconds. We've all seen these, all familiar. Um, but what we really want to represent is not just uncertainty, but uncertainty with known probability distributions. We're able to sample how long these durations will take. And so this is the com component of the PSTN, the probabilistic simple temporal network. Not only do we just have contingent edges represented in bold above, uh, but we have some known probability distribution or some approximate probability distribution representing these contingent edges. Unlike in STNU, where we have a min-max bound. Uh, this is great because, one, we can do a lot more informed decisions rather than just uh, saying, hey, is this controllable, is this strongly controllable, or a previous talk was like degree of strongly controllability, right? So now we have some sort of probability distribution that we can measure uh, and capture. So how do we solve these? There, it, Lund et al. in 2017 came up with this algorithm called Dynamic Robust Execution Algorithm, DREA. Um, and so how this works is that you capture some amount of probability mass for a risk budget. So you say, oh, um, we have this amount of possible leeway if we consider this amount of possible scenarios. We have a solution. And I'll go through how that works now in these next three diagrams. So consider we have an agent at A2, point A2, whatever it's doing at A2. And then sometime in the future, it ends up at A3. It says, oh, I'm at A3. Well, that's great. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we send this back to the scheduler and say, hey, I arrived at A3. And the scheduler says, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, that's some new information I gained. Why don't I go replan this new schedule? Let me get, generate a new set of dispatch times that we want to have in the future. And so this does a few things. One is that if you notice, the time for A3 now converged to 7.7, so we know that this happened at seven seconds. Um, so we don't actually need to consider any probability uh, of the time between A2 and A3 because we know how long that took now. Um, additionally, some amount of probability distribution between A4 and A5 has closed off because some future realities are no longer able to be realized. We now have more in information about the current state of the system. Um, but there's a few things wrong with this. Uh, if you notice, to do this, we had to communicate when we arrived, when we, uh, we had to communicate to the schedule that when we arrived at A3, that hey, we just arrived at A3 at this specific time. And then the scheduler had to go and replan uh, this new dispatch strategy, which is conducted by a binary search of linear programs, which is expensive. And, and then it has to send that back to the agent, which is not too great. Another problem is that DREA does this every single time we gain new information. Uh, this makes it really computationally intensive and communication dependent. So we have to have some sort of live communication channel uh, and constant replanning, which isn't great. So the goal of this research project was to identify um, some trade-offs between success rate robustness and rescheduling and communication. So high-level overview, just going over what DRA is, is you start off with some uh, binary search for linear LP at the top. And did something change in the environment? Anything at all? If yes, why don't we go reschedule our LP, go conduct this binary search, and send that to all the agents, and then keep doing that. If nothing's changed, well, keep doing what you were previously doing. And this is excessive. So if you might notice, there's some missing blocks in there, so we can fill something out and do better. So the first consideration is this condition that reduces the amount of rescheduling we do. And we call this the allowable risk condition. And we'll get into that what that is. But if you notice, one, this is where the name comes from, is you mean you have some mitigation of the amount of reschedules. As you all know, you can't spell a dream without mitigation. So let's go into how allowable risk 
is. So allowable risk is a risk-aware type of rescheduling scheme. And the idea here is we only really need to compute reschedules if enough uncertainty has accumulated from the last time we rescheduled. So we, reschedule, we schedule at the very start saying, hey, look, uh, this is our current, given the future plans, given how these uh, contingent events uh, distributions would look like, this is probably the best thing you can do. And so the agent goes around and, and steps through each of these events. Um, but as it's stepping through events, we've accumulated some uncertainty. We don't know what the agent has been doing. The scheduler doesn't know. Um, and so we can measure this uh, sort of as a proxy of a probability of success, right? Uh, each uh, contingent edge has some risk budget in, that we accumulate, and we represent that as alpha, and so the probability of success of the amount of contingent edges we've seen so far, we can represent as the one minus alpha to the power of k, which is the number of contingent edges we've passed so far. This is a lower bound, it's, it's very conservative, um, but what ends up happening is you can then count the number of k contingent edges since your last reschedule, and if this falls below, this, this uh, lower bound of success rate fall below some threshold that we set, we can say, oh look, enough has uncertainty has accumulated that we realize, hey, maybe it's a good plan to reschedule. Um, enough, we need to now consider that something has changed in the environment, we haven't accounted for, let's get a new plan out. Um, and we can tune this threshold, right? It's not just like, oh yeah, we can decide this for every single problem, we can decide this both live or for any individual problem. And we define this as MAR. So first, like, why would I come up with this? Uh, why would we come up with this? Is we identify, uh, let's test some empirical experiments, right? How does this actually do in the real world? And so to do this, we developed uh, a Monte Carlo-based simulator that ran various different uh, execution and dispatch strategies on a large set of PSDNs from previous papers, Land et al, um, and the Paris data work as well. Uh, it's an event-based simulator, and it has about, depends on the, the data set, but like 30 to 100 uh, events. And we simulate it 50 or 100 times, uh, and we ran identical simulations across for each of the threshold settings, each of the simulators, to ensure that there was no random noise introduced beyond what was generated for the Monte Carlo simulations. So every change you see is determined only by uh, the thresholds, or by other um, execution strategies. Great, so how does this look like for allowable risk? Um, so this is the graph that's generated, but to understand what's going on, first consider the left side. That means it's never reschedules. This is what would happen if we didn't do any rescheduling at all. On the right side, uh, this is always rescheduled. This is effectively just DRA. There's nothing really interesting of the, beyond that as well. That's the comparison. We're trying to do better than that. So what does uh, Dream allow us to do? It says, oh look, there's some regions in here that we pretty much get some free uh, success rate without doing any reschedules. Um, as about at MAR is equal to 0 0.5, right, we get about 90% of the success rate with 70% of the amount of the reschedules. That means about 30% of the reschedules account for only 5% of the success rate. So you can see there's a huge uh, tail end skewing here that we don't need uh, a, lot of the end of, uh, a lot of these reschedules because they're frivolous. So again, I mentioned this. Uh, there's another condition here, right? We, we want to not just reduce the number of reschedules, but the amount of times we need to communicate throughout each of the agents. And if you notice here, there's another missing block, which I imagine you can get filled out. And so this, we fill out, we can identify the goal here is to, once we have or rescheduled, do we really need to send this out to new agents? And we can consider this, consider this the sufficient change condition. And to go into more detail of that, it's another type of risk-aware uh, scheme, but in this case, it's a risk-aware communication scheme. Has the new system, the new schedule that we generated uh, sufficiently different than the last one? And we evaluate like so. Say we have an old schedule G and a new schedule G prime. G has uh, some risk budget alpha, and a new, our new G prime has a risk budget alpha prime. If the absolute value between each, the alpha and alpha prime is sufficiently large, greater than some threshold uh, MSC, then we say, look, the new schedule has changed enough. We, the, there's such a different, there was a need to actually reschedule. Maybe we should send this out to the, each of the agents because enough has changed in the environment that we shouldn't continue with the old plan. And so how does this look like? Um, again, same kind of concept, except uh, the, the axes are flipped, so 
left side is always sent, which is the same as DREA. Um, right side is never sent, uh, basically never send out a schedule. So how does that perform? Um, if you notice here, there's a specific uh, area when MC as MSC is equal to 0 0.0625, uh, that we see a very steep drop in the amount of communication needed while only a relatively small amount, about 10% loss in success rate. So we're able to identify various regions in, uh, that are able to be conducting less communication but still gain a very uh, get high rate of success. So like in this case, uh, about 50% amount of the schedules got sent out. So we only need to commute about 50% of the time for a loss of 10%. So another thing is, if you might notice, computation is exactly the same because uh, we're not reducing the amount of reschedules, just the amount of communication. Okay, so overall, what does the high level look like? If you notice here, these things can work in tandem. Uh, we have allowable risk, which is able to check to see whether we should compute a new reschedule. Uh, and sufficient change, which allows us to tell, determine if we should send out a new schedule. Um, I don't have enough time to actually go into the full results uh, about how these work in combination, but if you want, you can feel free to ask me about that, because I do have them an, as an appendix slide. Okay, so conclusion, future works, some highlights. Um, we identified some tunable thresholds, uh, which trade success rate for some communica uh, communication and uh, rescheduling so, which is great because we're able to identify locations where a lot of re rescheduling is unnecessary, a lot of communication was unnecessary, while still getting very high rates of success. Um, by being risk aware, that is determining, look, uh, if we know the probability distributions of the, of the present and what we've uh, passed, then we're able to determine this is how much risk has accumulated, that means we can determine uh, how much plan our plans may need to be changed. Um, which is great, and it's not just adaptable to the DRA system, but any sort of uh, scheme that we have inference on both future events and uh, past probability distributions. Um, future work, uh, is this about adaptable to communication windows? For example, if we know, in, in the case of like say a Mars rover, if we know that uh, we have communication for only 12 hours a day, is there able to optimize this for just various windows where we know we have communication rather than just say, oh, let's just reduce communication altogether. And what about time-based simulations? As mentioned, our Monte Carlo simulator was event-based. Uh, so can we improve this uh, for like si uh, discretized time-based simulations? All right, um, that's where I'm ending off. Uh, special thanks and citations that I mentioned. Oh, Sam Rubinos uh, was the introduction of PSDNs. I don't credit that myself to myself. So, I'll hide that side. all right. We have time for a question or two. Uh, yep, Chris. Oops, mistake. Backtrack. So, since Jeremy can't ask a question about his own paper, I'll ask one. Um, so, in the, if I understood correctly, in the first blue box, you're just adding up the number of contingent links that you've executed, and using that as your threshold. Sort of, yeah. So. Um, so one thing that we do is during reschedules uh, to, to identify the, the, the correct dispatch strategy or the, the most uh, the dispatch strategy that highest chance of success, we allocate some risk budget like alpha, right? And so that alpha can change over like times. Uh, the, so in each reschedule that can change over some amount of time. And so what ends up happening is we just, multi so you can get a guarantee of the success rate by uh, just considering like, oh, these probabilities chain together um, the same way you would like uh, get uh, independent, pro you, you assume you make an independency ass assumption uh, which works pretty well out in this case. Uh, you multiply out each of the probability distributions for the number of contingent edges you've passed so far. Does that explain your question? So, so I, th I think it does. To give you an example, if you've got two of the contingent links that you're executing yep. one after the other, and one happens to end early and the other happens to end late, um, you actually take into account that they kind of cancel each other out um, before you trigger the rescheduling. Yes, yes, because okay. we're able to account for the risk. The risk budget isn't the same across every distribution. Well, it is, but it, the, the how much it's stretched out isn't the same. 
Uh, another question, Dana. Thank you. Uh, presumably, the reason that an agent would want to communicate his change schedule to the other agents is that what they're doing uh, depends on this schedule in some way or another. And so I'm wondering if you might be able to uh, do things a little bit even more efficiently if you had information about which agents depended on this schedule and why and how critical it was. Perfect. That's the question I was going to ask. That's a great question. So uh, there is there is there is an exact there is uh, a few ways you can go about this. You can um, I'm trying to remember the way. There is not a decomposition, but uh, there's ways of separating each of the agents' uh, dependencies on each other, uh, which is uh, abs because obviously dependency is a pain, right? Uh, whenever you can able to guarantee that these two agents, uh, you uh, you can apply tired restrictions, which um, like create disjoint event sets so that they don't require uh, interdependency. And so if you're able to do that, sometimes you can, and I don't make the assumption you can in these cases, but sometimes you can. Uh, then you can identify, oh look, uh, we can only send, we can only, re we can decide, we can reschedule only on these uh, bound, these, uh, each of these agencies' sets of schedules. Uh, so yes, that is entirely possible. But, but I think Dana might have been referring to what I was talking about, which is what I was thinking, which is certain, only certain subparts of the schedule need to be communicated to different agents, so you could even consider the communication cost relative to that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you, you can. There's, um, th this makes the assumption, though, you're able to, that, uh, you are able to work within disjoint agents, right? Yeah. As, yeah. as long as you can disjoint the agents. But like if it's strongly true. controllable, they're all independent, right? So right, as long, yeah. as, as long as they're able to be independent. Yeah. Uh, I will say we did end up testing uh, some work on that, um, not on just decompositions, but on like dis uh, disconnecting agents from each other and removing interdependencies. The results were not as great as some of this paper, and so they didn't make it into the results of here. I do know that, I, th I believe that there is still work to be done in that area, uh, but if you want, I can talk to you afterward about uh, some tests we did, and so if you have other further ideas, I'll be looking into that. And just a side note, for a Mars rover, you'd be lucky to have one or two decisional passes that would you, you could communicate back to the ground and to round trip it, pass information back to the ground and then back up, not, I mean, not waiting for the next sol. Uh, you can't really do it. It's just logistically, it doesn't work out, but that's a side <laughs> note. Okay, uh, I know there are a lot of great questions, so I would encourage uh, people to catch all of these, you know, fantastic students, and Luke, of course, during the break, and let's thank our speaker once again.